and then I set off from from the edge of the box. Uh, the ball got cleared to Billy Painter, and we both set off and ran. He squared it, and Doncaster fans were all behind the goal. Uh, ball came to me. I took a touch and, and put it in, and um, that was the last touch of the season that, that won us the league. When sort of I made my debut, and there was an expectation of being able to do it week in, week out, day in, day out, um, I just wasn't prepared for it. I got told I was too small for a long time. Um, never played for my county team because. I was too small, got told by my teachers. Um, so it wasn't something that I had aspirations to be. I never sort of wanted to be a professional footballer. I was living away from home. I was drinking, I was gambling. I was sort of doing things for the first time that I'd never experienced. Um, and my football wasn't going great. Literally one day I was training with the YTSs. The next day I was training with Alan Shearer, John Barnes, Ian Rush, uh, Kenny Daglish, uh, Stuart Pearce. I went from Sunday League uh, to Premier League to non-league in five years which for anybody is really hard. I wish I'd played for another season, if I'm brutally honest. Hello and welcome back to my channel. And today's guest is James Coppinger. So James was a professional footballer for over 20 years, with a career spanning over 800 professional appearances, with almost 700 of them coming for one club in particular, Doncaster Rovers. So in this conversation, we speak about how James's career got started and how he actually went from playing Sunday League all the way up to Premier League and down to non-league in a matter of a few years and how James was actually close to quitting professional football altogether. So we speak a lot about mindset. It's clear to see that mindset is very, very important to James, both as a player and as now a coach. So we get into that and we also get into some fond memories that James has from his playing days with Doncaster Rovers. So before we get into the video, quick reminder to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and give the video a thumbs up if you do find value from this video. So let's get into the conversation with James Coppinger. James, welcome to the channel. How are you doing today? Yeah, good, Chris. How are you? I'm really good and I'm very grateful to you for agreeing to do this. Um, as a kind of someone that lives, lives in Doncaster, kind of grown up in Doncaster and a football fan, you are quite well known around here, James, which I'm sure we'll kind of get into uh, in terms of the different kind of clubs you've had. But obviously, Doncaster's played a, a big part of that. So um, what I'll do first, and James, I'll pass it over to you. For those that maybe don't know who you are or, you know, just a bit curious to, to kind of learn a bit more about your journey, just a brief overview from kind of starting out to, to now, really. And then we'll kind of delve into a little bit of each of each section as we go. No, yeah. Um, so James Coppinger, former professional footballer um, of 23, 24 years. Um, so sort of started out um, leaving school, done nothing different till I was 40. So I retired um, two and a bit years ago now when I was 40. Um, played over 800 career games, um, playing the Premier League, Championship League, One League Two in the National League. So played in every division. Um, and yeah, since I've retired, I've been head of player performance, um, been head of football and um, currently head of recruitment, but also coaching the first team as well. So um, quite a bit since I retired and yeah, sort of longevity in a in a football career spanning 24 years. Nice. So you've never, or see, until afterwards, you never really had a proper job then. You were always, <laughs> you were always kind of doing doing the football. So, I mean, we'll, we'll kind of start right at the beginning, James. So... I've read, obviously, in preparation for this, kind of do, reading interviews that you've, you've done previously, and um, I kind of got the impression that you, you've said that you didn't actually set out to be, like, it's not something that you would ever thought you would be, or, you know, you never really wanted to be a footballer in the early days. Is that correct? And kind of what, what's your thoughts around that? Yeah, I think um, growing up, I sort of grew up in a small town in, in the northeast, uh, Gisborough, um, and so sort of was a really tight, close family. So sort of my granddad lived over the road. My auntie lived around the corner. Um, so, yeah, played local football uh, for Martin Juniors all the way up until I was 16. Um, went to a school of excellence, but not for long, which was Middlesbrough. Had trials at Not uh, Nottingham Forest, Newcastle, Sunderland, down Middlesbrough. Um, got told I was too small for a long time. Um, never played for my county team because I was too small. Got told by my teachers. Um, so it wasn't something that I had aspirations to be. I never sort of wanted to be a professional footballer. I think nowadays there's so many kids grow up and want to be professional footballers and it wasn't something that sort of I wanted to be. I just enjoyed going out with my friends um, most nights on my BMX, um, around the streets, playing football. But um, yeah, while other people were going to sort of school of excellences, I was I was sort of doing that really. Mm. Nah, so you were signed by Newcastle when you were 17. Is that, is that, is that right? Seven. Yeah, so I, I I was playing sort of uh, Sunday League, sort of scored a hat trick when I was sixteen. Um, there was a Darlington scout there, so um, they offered me a trial at Darlington. Um, I went sort of did well, and then they offered me a two year YTS. Um, three months into the YTS, I got an England trial, 
um, went down and, and managed to get in, sort of represented England, travelled to Poland, um, played in Warsaw, uh, and then played in the European Championship qualifiers. Yeah. Um, and then Newcastle sort of bought me from from Darlington for for one point eight million when I was seventeen. Yeah, that probably is. Did that? What? How did you feel about that kind of fee at the time, then, James? Because that's that's a lot of money, especially back then as well. Did that add pressure to you? Did you feel that pressure? Um, I don't think I did. I think at the time when you're that age, I was sort of went in one day. Um, the manager called me to his office. David Hodgson had told me that Newcastle were interested and. Um, so my dad was coming with my suit and it was deadline day. Um, so we, we travelled up to St. James's, me, my mum and my dad. Um, and yeah, it was it was surreal because literally one day I was training with the YTSs, the next day I was training with Alan Shearer, John Barnes, Ian Rush, uh, Kenny Daglish, uh, Stuart Pearce. Um, and again, for somebody that didn't want to be a professional footballer, it was sort of something that, um, yeah, it was, it was something that I wasn't expected and never saw coming really. Mm. Yeah, sort of proper like... Baptism of Fire, really. Some of the names you've said there, obviously some amazing, amazing players. So um, you you ended up, was it one appearance for the first team, but did you had loan spells when you were in Newcastle as well, didn't you? You went out to Hartlepool and QPR while there. Yeah, so I, I ended up um, playing for the 17s and 19s um, under Alan Irving and John Carver. I uh, got to the semi-finals of the Youth Cup. Um, obviously, really good running Obviously, Shola Miobi, Stevie Caldwell, Gary Caldwell, we had some really good players. Um, and then Sir Bobby Robson came in after uh, Rude Hullet had obviously taken over from Sir Kenny. Um, and it was Sir Bobby that, that actually came in and put all the reserves on the transfer list. And I ended up sort of going out on loan to Hartlepool, doing really well, coming back and then made my Premier League debut against Tottenham at St. James's Park in front of 55,000, um, partnering Alan Shearer up front, which again, for me, wasn't sort of, it was sort of a surreal moment, but wasn't something that I, I sort of look at Newcastle, follow Newcastle now, and there's a lot of Geordies that say they've dreamt of this moment and, yeah. you know, we've sat in the Gallagher end and they've always wanted to play in the Premier League. And for me, it wasn't like that. Um, but it was it was an unbelievable sort of moment for me. So Bobby, who I'd watched at the 1990 World Cup, sort of probably the first sort of inspirational moment or experience that I had as a kid, um, watching him, watching Stuart Pearce, um, you know, for him to give me my debut and what an unbelievable manager. Um, yeah, it was an unbelievable moment and one that sort of I've never forgot, really. I wanted to ask you about Sir Bobby Robson because he's kind of, he seems like he was one of the nicest guys. I've never heard a bad word said about him, so I was just wondering what, what he was like to, to work with, although you were very young at the time. I mean, what, what, kind, of a, what kind of a chat was he? Um, yeah, he was an infectious, authentic, um, sort of just lived for football. I mean, when I was 19, when I made my debut and never really appreciated at that age, sort of thought I knew everything. Um, again, we'll go into it, but my mentality wasn't wasn't brilliant back then. I was never prepared for that moment. Um, that's why I only had one appearance, in my opinion. Mm. Um, so looking back, he was he was an unbelievable sort of person more than manager, in, in my opinion. I think um, he knew how to manage a dressing room. He knew how to manage individuals. Um you know, I left Newcastle two or three years later. I, I sort of we had a mutual friend, and he would always ask how I was doing, and he would always say, "Look, Bobby, Rob, Bobby was asking after you, and he wishes you all the best." And um, I partnered him a couple of times in pre-season when I didn't have a partner with the first team, and we were doing some press-ups, burpees, sit-ups, and he would do them all and have everybody in stitches. Um, but he was just an unbelievable guy. I watched his documentary recently, and sort of got quite upset about sort of I didn't realise a, a lot of the situations and you know the illness that he had and um yeah he was a remarkable man and like you say there's there's not I've not heard one bad word about him really. Hmm. Yeah you touched upon it a little bit there James so you said that the mentality you had which again it leads to a lot of things that I will we will speak about in terms of like the mental health and the pressures that you would have as a as a footballer. Um in the previous interview I at the time when you, you mentioned something about having kind of a small town mentality at the time, maybe you didn't I mean was it the fact that you thought you maybe didn't belong at that at Newcastle at the time, having such a what I'm trying to say is the the how quick it was from going from like you say the YTS and, and there, and then you're in with these players that are the best, you know, in the in the world really at the time. So did you have any sort of imposter syndrome there? Did you feel like you belonged or what what can you tell us about that? No, I definitely did. I think um growing up and going not going through an academy and not almost preparing for this sort of or that moment or um being in that environment. Uh, my naivety got me quite a long way. So me not really 
understanding the sort of um, severity of where I was. My dad used to say to me, do you realise the situation and, you know, the opportunity that you've got? Um, for me, I never, um, which again, sort of carried me to a certain sort of place where when people were probably feeling the pressure, I wasn't. Um, but when sort of I made my debut and there was an expectation of being able to do it week in, week out, day in, day out, um, I just wasn't prepared for it and never really knew what it was. Um, obviously, I've recently wrote a book around a professional mindset um, and the mental performance side of it and where that sits within being a professional footballer. Um, for me personally, and for a lot of professional footballers now, they talk about it's been 80, 90% of, of professional football or professional sport. Um and, you know, I was lacking in that area. Obviously, as you get older and you experience more um, and you can work on this, that's what I've sort of done over the last 17 years, 18 years. Um, and I managed to sort of have a successful career because of it. Um, you know, I, I put down my career from 22 down to my mentality and, and how I sort of approach things. Yeah, definitely. So you, you mentioned your dad there, James. So, I mean, what kind of role did your parents play at that young age? Was your dad kind of pushing you at that point? Did your dad play as well? Or you know, where did, how, did, how did that look for you? Yeah, my dad, he was sort of just local league. Um, but I had two granddads as well that were were sort of... So my granddad, uh, Coppinger, so my, my, my dad's dad, he was um, an avid Middlesbrough fan, so season ticket holder, 60, 70 years. Mm. Um and my my mum's dad, he lived over the road, so he did everything in terms of took me to football, um, cleaning my boots. He used to put like uh, masking tape on the bottom of my boots and write little messages when I was younger. Yeah. Um, and and he was the one that sort of drove me and my and my dad and my other granddad to sort of um, succeed. And I was up against my cousin, so my cousin he was at Middlesbrough School of Excellence. Um, so with my granddad supporting Middlesbrough, he was the one that had the pictures up on the on the wall and um sort of so I was sort of not battling it out but um was sort of in competition with him a lot of the time. Um and my best friends so between me, my best friend and my cousin, one went to Hartlepool, one went to Darlington and my cousin went to Middlesbrough. Mm. Um so I had some real good sort of competition and drivers and motivators when I was growing up um that sort of got me to to where I was. Mm. So then contract ends at Newcastle, you then you probably couldn't really have gone any further. You went all the way down to Exeter. So what what was what was the decision behind that, James? And obviously at that time as well, with you still being obviously very young, going all that way, was that a challenge for you, moving all the way down there? I'd say it was probably the best and worst um, move that I could have made. I had a year left at Newcastle. Uh, the ITV digital money um, sort of had, had gone. So there was sort of... It was really hard to get a club. I'd experienced two loan spells, so I didn't want to play reserve team football. Um, I didn't see my future at Newcastle. I think Sir Bobby sort of didn't want me to go, but sort of didn't want to sort of hold me back. Um, and then I was with an agent that sort of was just starting out in football. Um, so it was a it was a bad combination, really. And then managed to sort of speak to Exeter and John Corforth. Corforth was the manager who was a Geordie. Um, so, yeah, I travelled sort of 350 miles away from home, from sort of where I would, where I've been based my whole life and, with nobody around me, it was it was really really hard. Sort of, um, Michael Jackson um, was on the board at, at Exeter. Yuri Geller was the was the chairman. Um, Darth Vader. It was sort of this big sort of circus, if you like. Um, and they'd struggled for three or four seasons down the bottom of the the table. And I sort of later down the line, sort of worked out that I'd gone into sort of a losing mentality. Um, mm. When they lost games, it was accepted, um, and ended up getting relegated out of the football league in in the first season. Yeah, so that would have been yeah. So what is League Two now? Division Three. The lot you got relegated from there, so that is would have been the, the conference or equivalent of whatever it was called then. So yeah. Um. So you've gone from like say Premier League Newcastle all the way, and you're not even in the league at this point now. And that's when you kind of said in in previous um, interviews that I've read, James, that you're basically close to quitting. So can you talk us through that? How close was that, and what what were you feeling at that point um, of kind of literally not even being in the league anymore? Yeah, so I, I went from Sunday League uh, to Premier League to non-league in five years, mm. um, which for anybody is really hard. But um, for me, my granddad passed away, who I've just spoke about. So he died of cancer when I was 20, um, which I really found hard because, again, nobody had ever, I'd never had anybody close to me pass away. Um, my mum and dad had divorced and split up. Um, so I grew up in like um, a really tight knit um, family, never saw it come in and um, never had a home to go go back to. Um, my mum and dad had met different people so that was really hard um, 
so yeah, I was living away from home. I was drinking, I was gambling, I was sort of doing things for the first time that I'd never experienced. Um, and my football wasn't going great. So it was really, really difficult. And um, yeah, looking back, it was it was hard, but it was something that I had to experience to to get out the other side. I think I had Eamon Dolan who who got me back down to Exeter. Um, he sadly passed away a few years ago, but Eamon was unbelievable for me. He he sort of believed in me, trusted me, wanted me to come back down and um, play for Exeter and um, I had a really good season that second season when we were playing in the National League um, and obviously sort of Doncaster was showed an interest in January I managed to stay and then I, I left at the end of the season Yeah yeah. so um, in terms of then that if you when you were kind of feeling a bit down and you were thinking oh, you know maybe this is not right for me did you have any other plan for what else you could do if you were if you if you did leave football or was it just a, I don't really want to be in this situation anymore because it was a bit of a uh, like a negative uh, uh, club at that time as you mentioned it was a bit of a loser mentality did you have a plan for maybe you know, I want to leave football and do something else or did you not even have a have an inclination about that no I, I honestly didn't didn't think that far ahead I think when you're that age again you sort of um, just just saunter on by and think that things are gonna are gonna be fine and. Um, and that was the case. I think for me personally, I wasn't enjoying football and, and I, I started playing football because I enjoyed it. Um, regardless of who I was playing for or where I was, I absolutely loved playing football every day, training, playing games. Um, but then I got to a point where I found it really hard. And um, yeah, I, I sort of got out the other side and I think it made me stronger and made me appreciate sort of where I was and what I needed to do. But it was clear to me sort of which direction I need to go, which direction I needed to go in. Um, and it was to get back up north and to try and sort of establish myself and build a career um, at a club sort of closer to home. Yeah. Everything's better up north, James. I will. Uh, <laughs> I'll definitely say that. So obviously that leads us nicely onto, onto Doncaster Rovers then. So, um, which turned out if I'm, if my uh, research is correct, 17 year career at Doncaster, um, 2004 to 2021, obviously that's still going after even your playing time. Um, 695 appearances. Is that right? Am I right? Yeah. So, um, yeah. so obviously it's a it's been a long time so signed by was it dave penny that originally signed you james yeah yeah uh, yeah because I, I mean i'm not a doncaster fan i'm a sunderland fan but when i at that age kind of i was going to see donny because that's when i was playing sunday league so all my friends were donny fans so um you know dave penny was the manager at the time when i used to go watch him so what, what was dave what was dave like obviously he kind of i mean they got you for what 30, was the transfer fee around 30 30 grand is that yeah right? yeah yeah no it was about thirty thousand. um yeah, Dave was Dave was good. I mean, signed with them getting back to back promotions. Um, there was a real feel good factor around the club. John Ryan was the chairman, um, and they had some really strong characters, um, some winners, um, and yeah, sort of enjoyed being part of that. I think when I first went there, um, you could see there was a direction and a sort of ambition around the club, and something that I wanted to be a part of. And um, yeah, it, it took me a while to get going. I didn't score a goal in my first season. Um, and that's when sort of Dave Penny sort of introduced me to Terry Gormley, who sort of transformed my life on and off the pitch. Um, me and him and sort of working out what it was I sort of needed to do and, and sort of, again, working on my mentality and my mindset. Um, that was sort of the, the catalyst to, to sort of the next 17 years as a, as a professional footballer. So for those who don't know then, James, so uh, Terry Gormley mentioned there, so what... Who is he and what kind of role did he did he play? What what was he doing for or how was he helping you? Um, yeah, so again, I was performing well in training, doing well in training, um, but I couldn't sort of transfer it into a game. Um and Dave could see this and was getting frustrated. Um I could have probably gone on loan um to Rotherham. Um, but prior to sort of going on loan, I went to see Terry um at the old Bellevue. Um Terry was sort of a um not a psychologist, but he sort of a mind shaper, worked around uh, mindset um, and help him, helping people in that way. I met him just sort of because I was open to sort of improving. Um, and then within one session, sort of, he transformed everything. Um, it was clear that I was struggling with sort of a not go over sort of the death of my granddad, um, struggling with sort of dealing with that, um, dealing with other things as well, sort of off the pitch. Um, but also understanding 
sort of how to control sort of mental performance. So working on on that every single day. Um, again, I do it now. I've I've had a business for six seven years working with individual players on not mental health or mental performance on improving performance um, every single day. Um, and it's something I've been working on. Um, obviously 17 18 years now and um it's sort of evolved and it's sort of got clearer in terms of how i communicate it to people and players um but it was an unbelievable turning point for me uh, on and off the pitch yeah so i mean it's quite progressive that um because it's a long time ago that and kind of even now it's not really probably seen as um a popular thing as much as it probably should be so how were you at the time then james like were you receptive to did you just want to were you just open to new ideas on, on how to kind of improve yourself? And how did that, you know, in terms of, was there any negative, like, do I really need to go and see someone like Terry? Or how, how did you kind of feel at that, at that point? Um, I was willing to try anything, if I'm being honest, in terms of sort of improving and getting better um, for my football um, and for my sort of life off the pitch. I think for me personally, it's it's about both. So I think as a player, you have two, well, as, as a you have a you have two identities. So you have an identity as a player and you have an identity as a person. Um and it's important to sort of well for me personally, it was about being the best um best player and the best person. So whether it be a father, um, husband, son, whatever it looked like for me off the pitch, and then, you know, to be the best player, um that that's what it was about. And then meeting Terry and, and working with him and then eventually sort of stopped working with him and then sort of found my own way into sort of um what it looked like. Um, and then, like you say, wrote wrote a book recently, and have my own sort of um, structure around um, mental performance, sort of five pillars. And yeah, it's worked with with the players that I'm working with, and they've managed to sort of implement it within their performances and and off the pitch as well. So it's it's been an unbelievable journey in that respect. Um, and again, still keep in contact with Terry and um, have a, a fantastic relationship with him, and obviously be be forever grateful. Yeah. Nice. Well, definitely talk about the book um, very, very soon. Yeah. Just while we're on the Doncaster kind of topic here. So um, just want to kind of go through some of the, the highlights because there'll probably be a lot of Donny fans watching this, I would imagine, in terms of um, want to hear more from you in terms of the, your time that you spent there. So can you just talk us through some some highlights? Obviously, I've, you won the Johnson's Paint Trophy there, the promotion. The We need to talk about the, the Brentford game as well, by the way. I, I want to kind of hear your input on that. But just in terms of some highlights and some memories that you've, you've kind of got from your playing days at Donny. Yeah, I think there's been so many. I think um, obviously started with the cup run, the Carling Cup run where we beat Man City. Um, and again, sort of <laughs> leading into that game, I, I wasn't really going to be playing in that game. Never scored a goal for Doncaster. Um, and that sort of morning, I'd visualised scoring, scoring a penalty. So I was in the boardroom um, working with Terry and he said, what, what, what if the game goes to penalties tonight? Would you take one? And I was like, no. Um, and he was like, why? I says, well, in case I miss. Mm. And he was like, well, what if you score? And I'd sort of never really thought about that because I was too bothered about missing. And he said, look, we'll go through some visualisation of um, if you get one. And so we visualise walking up, putting the ball down, taking a step back, picking a side, taking it. Um, and then, like you say, that night it went to penalties and the manager asked who wanted one and I put my hand up um, and then ended up taking the penalty and scoring past David James and we beat Man City and in the Carling Cup, we beat Aston Villa and then we we sort of, um, we took um, Arsenal to penalties and we're winning 2-1 to the last minute. Mm. Um, so again, that then moments at Bellevue, uh, people still talk about them now. It was it was an unbelievable atmosphere at Bellevue and them nights sort of kick-started it for me. Um, we left Bellevue, went to the, the keep more. Um, Sean O'Driscoll then took over and we sort of won the Johnson's Paint Trophy in his first season. Um Millennium Stadium, Wembley was getting refurb, so we played at the Millennium Stadium. Um, I think there was 75,000 people there, one in extra time, Graham Lee with a header. Um, and again, that that gave me sort of, and us, the sort of feeling of of winning. Um, and then the season after, we ended up sort of beating Leeds in the playoff final at Wembley, um, 1-0, which again, scoring a hat-trick for me personally in the semi-final at home um, was was a dream come true and and something, again, was was probably the the best, most individual highlight that, that I had at Doncaster, um, which which was amazing. Yeah, I was at, I was at that game actually, James, and it was uh, I think you're downplaying it. It was as it was a good hat trick, by the way. There was it was three good goals, and I was watching the highlights before you joined just to kind of. Uh, and it's funny the 
Random, but the the referee of that game was um, from the highlights in Mark Halsey, and he's also been yeah. um, interviewed on this on this channel as well. So um, yeah, it's weird how that worked out. But um, in terms of that Brentford game you mentioned, so obviously every Donny fan will know about it. But just for for those that don't, if you if you're kind of unfamiliar with it, so just kind of paint the picture here, James. So it's um, league last day of the season of um, League One. Um, I'm right in saying this, yeah. and you needed Donny needed a point. Was it a point to go get automatic promotion? Um, yeah. yeah. Point to get ultimate approach in against Brentford, um, who would overtake them if you didn't get the point. So last minute of the game, Brentford get a penalty, um, miss the penalty, and obviously Donny go up and, and scored a winner straight from that. So can you just talk a little bit around that, James? Because again, I, I know a lot of Donny friends fans that that was a, an amazing day for them. So just kind of curious from your perspective. Yeah, I think I think obviously getting that promotion initially and then staying in the championship for four or five seasons. Um, then getting relegated was was disappointed. Obviously, things changed. Um, but then to bounce back with this 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 moment, I think we we had a fantastic season. I'd gone on loan to Nottingham Forest for six months of the season. Uh, came back in January, and then we managed to sort of go down to the last game of the season against Brentford at Brentford, where we needed a point, um, and they needed to win to go up automatic. Mm. Um, yeah, we conceded a a sort of penalty in the last minute. Um, and their penalty taker was on the pitch and Marcel Trotter, who was on loan, was on the pitch as well. So they they fought for a bit in terms of who was going to take it. Mm. He ended up taking it, uh, Trotter. He ran up, hit the bar, came back down. Um, and then I set off from, from the edge of the box. Uh, the ball got cleared to Billy Painter and we both set off and ran. He squared it and Doncaster fans were all behind the goal. Uh, ball came to me. I took a touch and, and put it in, and um, that was the last touch of the season that that won us the league. So Bournemouth were away to Tranmere, and they needed to win, and they ended up sort of drawing the game. And the trophy was there, and um, yeah. So for us to win the league on the last kick of the game was again something you dream of as as um, as a young kid. Um, and for me personally, been at the club for that long and experiencing that, and the fans, and just the whole sort of. Um, the whole day was was unbelievable. You couldn't have written a, a better script, really. Yeah, at the time I was an analyst at Sheffield United at the time, and we'd we'd finished our game. And I remember someone like oh, Brentford have got a penalty. Like you, your game was obviously a little bit later, kind of not quite finished yet. So it was kind of coming through like from what people were saying at the time. So yeah, it was it was a, a crazy ending. So I mean, what what happened after that, James? Did, did you come back to Doncaster and have a have a few drinks in Donny? Or yeah, that was the the that was the plan. So we. We sort of celebrated um, the changing rooms and then straight on the coach and then straight into Doncaster, got chopped off um, and then just out all all night. Um, and then we had sort of um, a presentation at the stadium the next day with the trophy um, and then out after that. And yeah, it was it was an unbelievable sort of season in terms of the the group that we had, the the players that we had, the sort of mentality. Rob Jones led, mm. led the group, captain. He was unbelievable, inspirational leader. Um, probably one of the best seasons, individual seasons I've ever seen. Um, so yeah, to be a part of that and to experience that was was a dream come true. And then again to experience it as a captain. So sort of, I think three years later we got relegated uh, into League Two, and then I had the pleasure of or the honour of captain in Doncaster um, to promotion that season under Darren Ferguson. Um, sort of scoring 10 goals, 15 assists, got in team of the season, got nominated for PFA player, player of the season, EFL team of the season. And again, my granddad passed away that that year um, when we got relegated and he was a big Middlesbrough fan and I visited him in hospital and uh, they just got promoted to the Premier League and I, I, I told him that we'd get promoted um, that, that season. And um, yeah, I used it as a massive motivation that season, every day driving in, it was sort of, yeah, so I've played on my mind, um, sort of listened to the same music every day and sort of put put quite a lot of pressure on myself to um, to make sure that we got promoted. And yeah, probably one of, arguably one of my best seasons as a player individually, but collectively to to captain the promotion was um, was an unbelievable honour. Mm. Nice. So I want to ask you then, James, I don't know what the average, um, you know, career span of a professional footballer is, but I'm guessing it's probably not 20 years or so that you've had. So what would you put that down to, James? What, what would you put the longevity down to? I mean, I don't know. Have you have you had many injuries? Or did you have many injuries when you were playing or, or no? No, not really. I think the average the average is eight years um, for a professional footballer. I think, like you say, 23 years. I've, I've sort of averaged 42 games a season for 
for 17 seasons I was at Doncaster and then for two seasons while I was at Exeter. So um, to do that, again, put it down to my mentality. I think uh, my love for football has never wavered. Um, you know, I never really picked up any serious injuries. I had a few ankle injuries, which sort of, I struggled sort of with my ankle ligaments. I think I've already got one in my in my right ankle. Um, but again, that comes down to wear and tear, I think. Um, but no, I think my mentality, I think, you sort of your retirement age is 35. I set targets and goals um in my twenties that I wanted to play till I was 40. Um and like you say, sort of managed to to play till I was 40. I, I signed sort of a year's contract every year from 35 to 40 and sort of put it down to every year proving myself. So I never ever never rested on my laurels, never looked backwards, always looked forwards. Regardless of what I did, I always sort of tried to prove my worth every day, um, try to lead by example. Yeah, nice. I mean, what, in terms of then some of the changes, James, what, what would you say is kind of, it, as being a footballer, changed from when you were the 17, 18 year old to, to when you were 40? What, what are some of those changes that you kind of notice over your time playing? As an individual or throughout football? or Just as a, just as a player, maybe some of the pressures on you as a player or just as the game in general in terms of yeah, kind of prepping for games and, and, and things like that. So it does lead on to another question in terms of the analysis as well, but if we'll kind of get to that in a second. Yeah, I, I think the biggest one is understanding what mental performance is. So from a young age, you probably, all you think football is, is the technical and tactical side, um, partly some of the physical side. Um, but for me, the mental is is basically how you think every day, um, dealing with disappointment, dealing with setbacks, dealing with injuries, um, you know, confidence, um, resilience, um, self-awareness, uh, accountability, all these things. It's understanding what that looks like and how to improve and develop it. And that's something that from sort of 23, as soon as I realised that I could do that and um, and that was an everyday thing. So every day you go into training, every day you have an opportunity to improve on these areas, you know, whether it be in a training um, session or whether it be at the training ground as an individual. Um, as soon as I realised that, it was something that I developed and improved. Um then I was doing that every day and it, it was sort of a superpower for me. It sort of felt like I was ahead of everybody else when people were struggling and, you know, finding it hard to deal with not having good games and, you know, finding it hard to deal with sort of not being on the, not being picked um, or the manager slagging them off or players not liking them or the fans having to go at them or um, just finding it hard in general. I was always the one that sort of felt, you know, like I don't, I don't sort of have that because I'm, I'm working on it. I'm, I'm improving on it. Yeah. Um, so as I got older, I just got easier. And then to a point where I think 33, 33, 34, it became me. Um, I think the biggest sort of notice was that through COVID. So I spent quite a bit of time through COVID. I was probably 39. Um, sort of questioning whether when I come back, would I be able to sort of jump back straight into it? And I think literally my from my first session, I sort of, as soon as I go on the pitch, I sort of get lost in it. It just becomes part of me. It's ingrained within my mind. It's ingrained within my makeup. Um, and yeah, that's through years and years and years of sort of doing it every single day um, and understanding what it looks like. And I think, again, for a lot of people and for a lot of players, they don't understand that it's every day and they find it really hard to do it. Yeah. Um, the most successful ones can do it and do it naturally. Um, but for a lot of people, they aren't aware that you can practice it every day. And that, that for me, is the biggest thing that I noticed from being 17 to, to 40. Yeah, nice. So just kind of a similar question in terms of what's changed, but kind of more in the context of analysis. So background, I'm analyst by trade, James. That's kind of a lot of the channel is around kind of sports analysis. So I was just curious to ask you how you found that that's changed. For you as a player, were you always, are you a player that kind of um, took took part in the analysis? Was that a big thing for you? Obviously the mindset's a big thing, but in terms of video analysis, is that something that was on your radar a lot? And did that change kind of as you kind of got older as a more experienced player? Yeah, massively. I think I, I was very, I'm a very visual person, so I struggle to read books and so sort of, so I, I like doing and seeing. Um, from a young age, both my granddad's videoed all my games. Yeah. Um, so I would watch my games back unconsciously and see myself playing. Um, and for me, now that I know sort of and the impact that has, um, I feel like it had a huge part in my development growing up. Um, watching the way I kicked the ball, the way I ran, where I ran, um, all them things, I think sort of, uh, played a huge part. I sort of always enjoyed looking at the games that I'd played, regardless of the result. I always felt like I needed to see certain things. Yeah. Um, and like, again, working on the mentality, it's it's a huge part of it. So if you always see 
the game through your eyes. So you, if you never look at yourself playing, you don't know what you look like or you don't know how you're coming across. Um, I'm huge on body language. So body language is like 55% of how we communicate. So it was a game changer for me in terms of understanding how important that was. Um, I was a really poor communicator from probably 17 to 23. Um, so I didn't communicate well, my tone of voice, um, you know, how I, how I carried myself off the pitch and how I carried myself on the pitch. So as soon as I understand how that worked, when I when I, when I analysed my performances, I could see why people didn't gravitate to me as sort of why they thought that I wasn't trying or why they thought I wasn't working hard. Um, and then I could then adapt and work on that. So, um, yeah, sort of uh, analysis has been massive in terms of my development um, and still is. I Before we came on here, I was going through a, one of the players and analysing his game from the weekend and going through his clips and then sort of putting that down and then sort of we... I, send him ILP so he, he works on certain things every single game um, and for me personally it's it's up there with the biggest tool in terms of development um, but again it comes down to how you communicate it and the sort of how open the person is to to sort of opening up his mind to learning or her mind yeah yeah so one thing you, you've touched upon uh, pro mindset earlier on in the conversation here so I just kind of want to ask you a little bit more about that so that is is that your company that you kind of work with up and coming players at the moment in terms of their mentalities is that fair to say yeah yeah so i've had it for a while um and yeah work with players um at all levels individually and collectively um on again sort of i've i've wrote the book and referencing the book for a lot of a lot of what i deliver uh, i deliver workshops around and i'm doing it with the 18s at doncaster at the minute um around mental performance um and for me personally it's something that I look back and think, you know, if somebody had done that when I was that age, yes. um, it would give me an unbelievable foundation. And that's all it is. It's a foundation. It's a starting block for people to understand that actually you can work on this every single day. And I <laughs> I always go, go on to them like, you must get sick of me talking about every day. I mention every day um, because it's not something you do when you're feeling down. It's not something you do when you're feeling good. It's not something you do when you're just playing a match. It's it's every day you walk out the house, you get an opportunity. Every day you come into the training ground, you have an, op an opportunity to improve in all these areas. Um, so yeah, pro mindset was was developed again. Professional mindset, that's what it is. It's it's understanding that to have a professional mindset, um, it, it lays the foundation for you to get the best out of yourself and basically fulfil your potential in the technical, tactical, and physical areas. Yeah. Definitely. So in terms of then some pressures that you would you and other footballers will will kind of have on your back, really. So you obviously got the fans um, giving you giving you some, you know, when the, the times aren't going so well, dealing with things like relegation, poor performances, injuries and and probably a big thing now, maybe more so now than, than when you started, James, would, would be like social media and things like that. So do you touch upon them kind of things with, with the players you work with? Yeah, no, all of that. I think... Um... All of that has a bearing on performance um, and how we feel off the pitch. Um, but it's understanding how to how to control that. Everything that we speak about, it's about um, giving yourself the best opportunity of performing um, every day. But but most importantly, on a match day. Um, so it's it's understanding how to control them things. Whether it's social media, not being on social media, um, you know, putting yourself in a position where you're not having to deal with, listen to negative comments, um, negativity surrounding you or the team, um, whether it's dealing with setbacks, disappointments, um, it's understanding that they're going to happen um, and they're going to happen every day. So as a player, you're scrutinised every single day um, by managers, coaches, players, um, you know, your family, your friends, um, but it's understanding how to cope with that, how to deal with that. It's working on strategies. So again, I had a, I developed a strategy, a 24-hour rule after a game. So 24, 24 hours to um, you know, really enjoy maybe scoring a hat trick after I scored a hat trick in the semi final. But after 24 hours, it goes in the bin, and I look forward to the next game because I know for a fact that I'm never going to get judged on, um, or I can't just rely on that one game. I've got to do it again and again and again. And I think, um, you know, if I'd had a really bad game, I'd got 24 hours to, to sort of feel sorry for myself, and then I'm back in and I've got an opportunity on Monday to, to put it right. And that was a strategy that I developed. I think so many players don't realise they can do that. And what they do is they just continue to do the same thing over and over and over again and, and expect a different result. And it, it never happens. I've seen so many players have a good game and have a good performance and, and live on it for weeks, months. And before you know it, they've been released and they've, not, they've got no club and they've not moved on and sort of 
had a career in football. And a lot of this is lads that have got probably more talent than me. Um, you know, but for me personally, it's it's not just about talent. It's again, it's it's about how you think and, and how you approach things. Yeah. I mean, in terms of when you were kind of getting to the end of your, your playing career then, James, was it did you have plans on what you wanted to do after? Because obviously you've got that kind of the coaching route, the the other kind of stuff. Did did that did you have a plan set in mind or and also, when you retired, was it was it kind of, did you just know there and then? I mean, so you hear some ex-pros say, you know, my body had gone, my knee had gone or whatever. Like, what was it for you? Obviously, you reached the age of 40 or whatever. So, um, but did you kind of get to the end? When you were 38, did you know you had two more years left in you? Or how did how did that look? I think from from in my 20s, I wanted to play till I was 40. I think I sort of, sort of enjoyed what motivated me was people sort of giving me adulation and, you know, saying, look at this, this guy's doing it at 36, 37, 38, 39, 40. He's contributing. I scored five goals in my last season. I scored a um, free kick against Hull when I designed the kit. Um, you know, moments like that motivate me and keep me going. Um, I wish I'd played for another season, if I'm brutally honest. So looking back, I genuinely wish that I'd played for another season. I really feel, I feel good physically now, to be honest, at 42, 43. Um, it was never the physical part of it or side of it. Mm. Um, so it was more down to the fact that I was 40 and, you know, I can't go on forever. And, you know, um, unfortunately for me, my, my dad couldn't come to my last game. He'd watch me my whole career. Mm. Um, so it, it wasn't an easy sort of decision. But um, I think for me personally, to play till I was 40 and come out unscathed, not injured, you know, be able to sort of play five aside and, keep fit um and for me to for it to be on my terms i think as well was was a huge was a huge um yeah plus an advantage and it 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 felt right but i do i don't regret much but i do think that if i'd have played another year um i think i would have sort of enjoyed it and still sort of been able to contribute nice how many career goals did you have james how many did you get to? yeah 97 um, so you need three more years. That's what you should have done. One more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think again, I, I was not prolific by any stretch of the imagination, but I think um, I scored quite a few good goals. I think um, I was more motivated by contributing assists. I got quite a lot of assists in my position. I remember Rude Hullet saying to me when I played as a nine, um, as a nine, you'll only ever get judged on how many goals you score. Um, straight away, I knew that I wasn't a nine because. I never, you know, I played with Billy Sharp, you know, the, the championship all-time top scorer. And I played with Alan Shearer, the, the Premier League all-time top scorer. And both of them, every single time they went out on a pitch, they expected to score. Um, I didn't. I had a huge, a huge burning desire to win and to help other people on the pitch. So to link, to create, to get assists. Um, and that was how, and I don't know whether that came from not taking responsibility. So my dad used to say, you need to score more goals. Um and from a young age, I didn't want to miss. So whenever I got a chance, I didn't want to miss. Um, so I thought of, got sort of went down the avenue of trying to set people up. Um, and that became part of my game. So again, probably the last four or five years of my career, I was up there in terms of key passes. I was up there in terms of assists in the league and at Doncaster. Um, and I prided myself on on them sort of stats. And um, yeah, that was what motivated me really. Yeah. So where, where does kind of coaching come in then, James? Are you doing your coaching badges now or did you start them when you were playing or how, how does that kind of look? No, I think, again, like going back to the last question sort of sort of coincides with this one. I think retiring late isn't always easy. I think, you know, people sometimes retire at 32 and go into coaching, yeah. which would give them eight years ahead of where I am. So I'm two years sort yeah. of retired. And I think, I think, you never really know what you want to do. Um, you sort of have an idea, but you never really know once you retire what how it's going to feel or what it's going to look like. I think for me personally, um, I've sort of been on a journey in in the last two years in terms of my role at Doncaster's head of player performance um, and head of football operations where I've sort of been off the pitch um, and, and had a really good experience in terms of looking at how it works from, from the top end um, and then also working with analysing and working on one-to-ones with players um, but now I'm on the grass every every day, really, in terms of um, coaching with the first team, um, helping obviously the first team manager and the first team assistant, um, and then doing opposition scouting and uh, recruitment. So I'm doing a bit of everything, and I really, really, really enjoyed the coaching. I'm on my UEFA B. Um, did that in the summer, um, so I'll be looking to go into my UEFA 
um, air license. Um, and I've been coaching my kids' teams all the way through under sevens, eights, nines, tens, elevens, twelves, thirteens, fourteens, fifteens, sixteens, seventeens. So I've basically done every age group, fives, sevens, nines, elevens. Mm. Um, had a game today, one four one. Um, my son scored and um yeah unbelievable satisfaction watching these kids that i've had since they're eight years old now under 16 sort of mm. implementing certain things not just as as players but as people um as, as young adults uh taking responsibility um it's an unbelievable sort of um yeah it, it gives me probably just as much satisfaction as it as i did when i was a player so that's probably the route that that i'll end up going down in terms of sort of um that's where i see my future going um, I do enjoy the coaching side of it and something that I've sort of basically think that I can I can add value in. Yeah. Nice. So you, you mentioned your book before, James. I, I will link that down below as well. But um, how did that come about? Was it something you've always like thought for a while and wanted to do a book? Because it obviously leads in nicely with the, the pro mindset stuff as well. It seems like there's a big link there. So can you just talk us around the, the book project and how, how that was for you? Yeah. So I, I wrote the book two, two and a half years ago. Um, I think when I was growing up, there was nothing nothing out there in football. There was loads of things in sort of American sport and um, sort of self-development business, but there was nothing in, in football in terms of improving on your mental performance, um, on your mentality. So I wanted to put something out there for younger players. Um, the book is called Ahead of the Game, A Professional Mindset. And it's basically, um, that's what it is. It's it's around sort of my journey, my story, but also um, sort of giving people an understanding of, the foundation of of what I believe is mental performance um, and how they can work on it and Im implement it on, on themselves, um, training days, game days, um, and just, you know, as a person as well. So um, it's been really good because like you said, I've been doing it um, with the 18s and sort of um, the impact it's having um, on and off the pitch has been really good. Mm. Nice. So one thing I do kind of ask all the guests on here, James, is, is kind of advice. So I'm going to kind of tailor it to you in terms of, what advice would you give for a young footballer? So someone that's maybe at that 16, 17 year old wanting to make a career um, even as half as good as you would be, would be a good one. But in terms of just advice for young footballers and what, what could you say in, in that point? Um, I think first of all, it's understanding where you want to be and where you want to go. Um, I think for a lot of people, um, they don't set goals and targets and they just sort of have it somewhere floating around. Um, I think understanding where you want to go and then working out how you're going to do that. Um, I think a huge part of that is believing in yourself. So I think without believing in yourself, um, you know, you it's really hard to achieve anything. I think, you know, I speak to my daughter now about anything's possible because um, I'm a huge believer in that. And I think, you know, having that, again, calling it a superpower, I think working with players now, you can see the ones that actually genuinely believe that, that anything's possible and that they can achieve it. Um, but setting targets and goals, working out how you're going to do it. Um, and then massive action. I talk about it all the time. It's it's every day. Mm. Um, it's not something you do just on a match day. Um, we, you, um, whoever it is, has an opportunity every day to improve. So if you think you're doing enough, you're not. Um, everybody can do more. It's finding out how to do it, asking the right questions. Um, and I think a lot of the time, the best always leave clues. So I think... You know, when you listen to them getting interviewed, when you see podcasts and people on the telly now, if you listen to them in the right areas, you can you can get clues. There's so many, so many of the best want to tell you how to do it. Um, it's just whether you can open your mind up to listening and, and then applying it to, to how you do it. Yeah. So you're kind of acting a bit of a mentor then to these young players and uh, James and a number of names have come up during this conversation. But for you personally, who maybe name a couple then who probably had the most impact on, on your career maybe their coaches maybe their other players um just that's had a you know profound effect on, on you and obviously i'm sure terry is one of them people uh terry gomer you mentioned here but just in, in terms of any anybody else that's had a big impact yeah i think obviously my granddad my dad um my mum um sort of growing up in a tight-knit family i think having a, an unbelievable sort of um sort of family growing up with a with an unbelievable work ethic had a huge impact on me. So I've always been organized, always sort of worked hard. Um and then the coaches that I've I've worked with, you know, Stuart Gibson, who was my coach at Darlington, sort of goes under the radar. He was well ahead of his time. He was giving me sort of VHS videos to to watch, um, telling me to take notes. This was in 1998. Um 
So like he he would be the star and then working with John Carver, working with Alan Irvin, who have gone on to have John Carver's assistant coach at Scotland. Alan Irvin was at West Ham. Um, obviously working with Bobby Robson, uh, Rude Hullett, um, so Kenny, and then moving into coaches like Eamon Dolan, um, you know, who had a f- massive impact on me, getting me back down to Exeter. Mm. Um, and then I'd probably say Sean O'Driscoll and Darren Ferguson at, at Doncaster. Sean O'Driscoll over five years probably had the biggest impact on me, yeah. like got me as a person, was very the same as me, organised, consistent, um, methodical, always wanted to know why we were doing things. And that's that's the same as me. That's how I was brought up. Mm. Um, and again, I think you're conditioned growing up to to gravitate to a certain style of coach or manager. Um, and then sort of, again, sort of working with uh, Terry Gormley uh, sort of transformed everything in terms of how I sort of see things. And again, it's just then sort of players and individuals that you meet and get on with um, along the way that form sort of the way you look at things and the way you perform. But again, I've had so many that it's hard to sort of pinpoint um, ones individually, but probably the ones that I've mentioned have, have had the biggest impact. Nice, nice. Uh, well, I mean, I've gone through pretty much everything I wanted to, to ask you, James. Is anything, like I said, I'm going to link the book down below. Is there anything else you want to give a shout out to? Any any closing remarks you, you want to add for, for people that are listening? No, I just think, again, sort of podcasts and um, I think there's so much out there. You know, when, when I was growing up, when I was wanting to be a professional footballer or, or when I started to be a professional footballer, to improve um, in all those areas, it was really hard. Um, again, going back to VHS, DVDs, it was... For people that don't learn by reading books, it was really hard. Again, audio books are massive, podcasts are massive. Um, there's so much out there to improve on. Um, and again, for people listening, I think it's it's almost coming out of your comfort zone and doing it. Just doing it was the was one of the things that we spoke about with Terry. Is just do it. I used to sort of get up to a crossroads and I used to overthink everything. So I used to be like, oh, what should I do? Uh, should I do this? And what if I do that? And if I do that and that happens, so I, I wouldn't do anything. Mm. Um, so I think my sort of, my last bit of advice would be just to do it. Um, if you've got good people around you, if you're strong enough and you, if you're in a good place, if you work on your mentality, then, you know, when you have a setback or a failure, um, it's part of learning and you can develop and improve. Um, and again, by doing it, it's the start, it's the beginning. Um, your version one at the minute, but, you know, six months, 12 months down the line, you can get to version 50, version 100, and that's the way to improve and get better. Nice, nice. Good way to end it. That's that's brilliant, James. Listen, thanks very much for your time. Uh, good luck with, you know, Doncaster this season. Good luck with your coaching. Good luck with everything else. Um, but yeah, thanks thanks very much. Appreciate, appreciate it. Pleasure. Cheers, Chris.